My name is Alicia McBride, and I'm the director of Quaker leadership here at FCNL. And I want to welcome you to this December Quaker Changemaker event. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I've been thinking of it as an exciting and bittersweet conversation. But before we get into that, I want to ask my colleague, Bobby Trice, to share a little bit about how we're going to gather. Thanks, Alicia, and welcome, friends. I'm Bobby Trice, the Quaker Outreach Coordinator on staff at FCNL, and I'll be running technology for this event this evening or afternoon. Just a few tech considerations to keep in mind. Uh, as many of you are already doing, please say hello in the chat. You can share your name, location, and meeting church, if any. We're really glad you're here. I'm seeing people sending uh, greetings from DC, from Maryland, from Detroit, all over the place. Keep them coming. And as you can see, we are recording this evening's speaker portions, uh, but the audience will not be included in the recording for privacy reasons. Even so, feel free to turn off your video if you're uncomfortable keeping it on. Captioning is available automatically. If you do not want to see the captions, however, you can click on the live transcript option on your Zoom toolbar and click hide subtitles. We'll have some time for you to ask questions towards the end of the event, and we will do our best to address as many questions as we have time for, but we likely will not get to all of them. Please submit your questions in the chat, and I will collect them and direct them um, to our panelists. And please contact me if you are in need of Zoom tech support. You can private chat me from Zoom's chat bar or email me at rtrice at fcnl.org. That's also in my Zoom name if you need to reference it. And with that, I'll turn things back to Alicia. Thanks, Bobby. So as we get started, I just want to take a few moments for some grounding worship. Thank you, friends, and thank you for being here again. So I, I said at the beginning that this conversation is exciting and bittersweet because it's exciting because in my own journey as a Quaker and working in the FCNL's Quaker community, I have found myself continually circling around this question about what it means to be the public representative of a faith that is intensely personal. What is the relationship between my individual leading and relationship with God and my action in the world? And I expect these are live questions for many of you as well. I was thinking back when I was in graduate school, um, I went to a forum at University Friends Meeting in Seattle. I just sort of showed up one day and they were having this forum about uh, the sort of divide or connection between activist and contemplative friends. And it seemed like such a perfect, um, conversation to, to wander into uh, for then my, my life to bring me back to FCNL and, and to these questions. And it's also bittersweet because this is Diane Randall's last public event as the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And I've had the, the pleasure and the honor of working with Diane over the past decade, and I've really learned a lot from her as a, a leader, a mentor, and a supervisor. And so I'm it's very special to me to get to be in this conversation. Diane came to FCNL in 2011 as its fourth leader and the first woman to serve in this role. She brought deep activism and civic engagement experience from her work addressing issues of homelessness and affordable housing in Connecticut, to work in the nuclear freeze movement and for the abolition of the death penalty. She came into FCNL seeing the potential for this Quaker grounded advocacy, and she challenged us to be bold, strategic, prophetic, powerful, and relentless. In a tumultuous decade, Diane has overseen FCNL's growth and influence in our capacity to make change, in our Quaker physical presence on Capitol Hill, and in the reach of FCNL's network. So welcome, Diane, and thank you for being here for this conversation about your experience in faith, ministry, and leadership as a public friend, as the General Secretary of FCNL. 
Felicia, uh, and thank you for your role as director of Quaker leadership, who gets to plan these Quaker change makers for inviting me as, uh, as you said, for my last public event. Um, I shared probably 11 months ago with our executive committee that I would leave FCNL at the end of the year. And in some ways it feels like it's been a long year, but it's also um, gone by quickly as really uh, the last 10 years have gone by fairly quickly. So um, it's great to be with you and really um, inspiring to see the people who are with us on this call. Thank you all for introducing yourselves, putting in land acknowledgements. Um, there are, I might say, a lot of people on this call who would be um, great people to engage in this particular conversation. So I'm looking forward to see, seeing about our conversation and then to see what follows after. Yeah, I am as well. So to get us started, can you just give us a sense of how you got here? So what are some key moments in your spiritual journey that led you to Quakerism, to political engagement, and to FCNL? Well, thanks for the question. Um, I, I am a convinced friend. And so it was, um, I always tell people it was the Quaker peace testimony that really drew me to Quakerism. Um, I had become active in the nuclear freeze movement in the Midwest, in Omaha, Nebraska, where I was living at the time. And um, when I moved to Connecticut with my not yet, but soon to be husband, Roger Catlin, um, there was a Quaker meeting there in Hartford. And so I visited the Quaker meeting, walked into the meeting house, saw the peace testimony on a placard and thought, I think these are my people. And went to my first meeting. And like many people who go to their first meeting, not having grown up there, it's a little surprising if you go to an unprogrammed meeting and there's just an hour of silence and to learn how to be in that, in that waiting worship was pretty powerful. But I also will say that um, I also tell a lot of people that it was the matriarchs that really kept me. Um, I went to a meeting that had some very stalwart, um, deeply grounded women and, and men, but it was seeing women in leadership and in quiet, powerful leadership roles that was really compelling to me as a woman um, whose faith was important to me. So that was, I, I guess I should keep talking about getting to FCNL. That was getting to Quakerism. And then when I, uh, when this position came open, uh, I guess I first probably heard about it. I think it was almost a two year search, but I heard about it maybe late 2009 or 2010. And a handful of people said to me, you know, you should look at this position. I was lobbying at the time involved in public policy. Um, and, you know, I wasn't really thinking I wanted to, uh, I, I never thought, oh, I would definitely want to work for a Quaker organization, or I never thought I really wanted to leave Connecticut necessarily. But um, the confluence of the opportunity um, that this drew and, and the fact that people, you know, encouraged me just to even, you know, consider putting my name forward. And, um, and I did. And, you know, it just, it, it began to feel like a calling. And um, I think, as we get into talking about public ministry, I think that is one of the aspects that um, a public ministry, when we experience it, as in any kind of ministry, uh, there's a sense that um, we feel called and uh, obligated almost to, to follow through. Well, you mentioned the importance of the peace testimony and, and the people that you encountered but can you talk some about what are the aspects of Quakerism that have been particularly important to you in your work at FCNL? And those could be, you know, the personal aspects, but also um, things that have helped you professionally in this job or in this mm. role. Well, I would say that being, um, being part of Hartford Monthly Meeting was obviously a very rich part of my spiritual formation, as was participating in New England yearly meeting and kind of growing up in that. Um, and, and, you know, part of our faith, I think, is also obviously being in community and, um, and relating to other people and seeing how other friends uh, live their lives. You know, there's a lot of um, conversation, I imagine, that we're going to have about letting our lives speak. And that is, I think, something that many friends feel is an inherent aspect that, that our lives are not relegated to what happens only when we're participating with other Quakers, not only on during times of worship or during times of committee service, but it really is throughout, um, throughout our lives. And so um, seeing that in other friends, um, whether it was, you know, the people in my meeting who 
you know, early on were composting and riding bikes, you know, back before most people were even thinking about doing that, or whether it was people who were, you know, protesting at electric boat or, you know, any number of um, feelings of sense of being called to witness, I think was, was really important. And so the notion of witness as an inherent aspect of who we are as friends, which can manifest in a lot of different ways was really important. Um, I had become politically active, you know, as working on homelessness and housing issues in the Connecticut General Assembly and lobby. Um, I, I actually ran for the local school board in 1995 in West Hartford, um, significantly because of, you know, disagreements over uh, racial, a racial justice act that was about redistricting. And um, when I got involved in politics, I really had a moment where I questioned whether or not I could live my spiritual faith and be a political person. Because, you know, for a lot of people, politics is really, you know, just kind of a, a corrupt thing to participate in. And um, so that that was a that was a, a kind of an evolution for me almost, you know, before I got to FCNL, but but not like it wasn't immediately clear to me that that I could do both. Um, and um, I do believe it's possible to be politically engaged and to be profoundly spiritual and committed as a as a friend or as or as a person of faith. Not it's just not a Quaker thing. It's obviously there are many people of faith who are both politically active and and uh, deeply um, faithful. Thank you for that. And it is piano practicing time at my house. So if you hear <laughs> a little bit of uh, background noise. Enjoy How about the trombone? Are we going to hear trombone too? Uh, I don't think so tonight. You might hear some drums. It's, it's a very musical <laughs> experience uh, at this time of night in my house. So one of the things I remember, you know, I, I, have, I was at FCNL when you were interviewing for this position. Um, and I remember you came and gave a presentation to staff and, you know, um, I think the question was a little silly and you, <laughs> you, uh, you did a good job addressing it. But uh, one of the things I remember you talking about was around your discernment about becoming a public friend and about that being something new you were taking on by becoming the head of FCNL. And I want to come back to that topic um, after your experience in this role. Um, to hear what, what does it mean to you to, to be a public friend and to be sort of representing <laughs> Quakers on Capitol Hill? Uh, when I started in 2011, I remember uh, Joe Volk being very explicit, as were other people saying, um, while you are representative of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which is a Quaker organization, you don't necessarily represent all friends or all Quakers. And that was good advice. Um, and, and as many of us know, there's a little bit of a hesitancy sometimes, you know, for Quakers to say, I can explain Quakerism to you because as you noted at the very beginning, it is a very personal uh, faith and people uh, find um, their own sense of the divine, their own sense of faith and practice um, individually, as well as within community. I, I do believe it's really important to be part of a community. Um, but for me, the notion of being a public friend was, was kind of almost like being out as a Quaker. You know, it was like, I am a Quaker, and that is, that is a primary identity for me. And while I think there are many friends who feel that, um, people aren't, don't talk about it a lot. And, you know, if you are an ordained clergy person, you know, if you wear a collar, if you, you know, have some sort of, you are always identified publicly, you know, with a religion or with that faith. But for friends, that's often not the way we um, identify. And in fact, for many friends, uh, we, we tend to think that um, I will live this faith quietly, you know, that I, you know, people will, will see by my life, you know, who I am. And so for me, being a public friend, indicated that I had to be able to talk about what my own spiritual, what called me to um, this work, what, what called me, in addition to the peace testimony, you know, we talk all the time as friends about our testimonies, but in addition, in addition to that being a hallmark of the Religious Society of Friends, your question your, that you asked earlier about the, the faith and practice of friends, what is it that, that calls us to do this work, particularly at the Friends Committee on National Legislation? And I think I've come to see that um, 
you know, it, I will certainly say I've come to see that it's not only Quakers who have this kind of deep sense of grounding about um, a, a sort of formation that the world um, can be a better place and we have a role in that world to do what we can. Um, and that, that sense of knowing that there is something for us to do and wanting to live into it um, is, you know, it's an amazing gift when we find that. And um, so I think that's been part of it. But I think for by just going back to the notion of being a public friend is distinct from being a quiet friend or, you know, is really kind of being publicly out there and saying, this is who we are. You know, one of the things that I found a lot of uh, joy in this role is, is, is uh, connecting with other heads of Quaker organizations uh, because we all are in some ways, if you're identified, you know, if you're working for a Quaker organization, you know, as you are as well, you know, you are sometimes called to speak about that work and called to explain the work and the and being a Quaker. And so um, I think that has also been for me part of the meaning of being a public friend, uh, being able to speak into what I believe. And, and I think it's actually a pretty good practice for all of us as friends um, to, to have the conversations and dialogue that draw out that notion of, of, of what about uh, being a friend is meaningful to us. How do we make meaning out of that? And how do we make meaning specifically in relation to um, the practices that we promote at FCNL? I'm going to just say a couple of things, more things about that is that, you know, anybody who's been involved with FCNL and many people on this call have been, um, we really uh, encourage and train people to build relationships with members of Congress, that that relational aspect of engaging in lobbying and um, looking to affect change is very compelling. And that to me is a, a, it's not only Quaker, but it is essentially Quaker is that relationships matter a great deal. Listening to people matters a great deal. And, um, and, and seeing that of God in the other, respecting one another's and the inherent dignity of each person is, is absolutely, um, I think, fundamental to our practices. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know you and I have talked about as my role has changed at FCNL and and taking on this Quaker leadership role. You know, I was very nervous about in some ways stepping into that public friend space of of having to be identified as uh, an FCNL Quaker when I was when I was out you know at my meeting and things. Um, and I've actually found it. it that my my work and my life feel more integrated accepting that role than it than it did, you know, when I was trying to keep my faith identity and my work at FCNL separate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a really for me it's been a very interesting experience of, you know, of surprise, <laughs> of actually um, the pieces of the role fitting together um, better than I than I had hoped. Do you have another way that you would, anything else you would add to that definition? If, if someone said to you, what is a public friend? I think the thing, um, to me, it's about not apologizing for mm. what motivates you. Because mm. I think that, you know, as you said, a lot of people are active in the public sphere. And, it, and in some ways, like, I think being motivated by faith is maybe not, you know, certainly in, in the sort of progressive political space is not necessarily what is motivating most people. And so sometimes it feels like you're sort of, there can be an instinct to sort of not put that part of you forward first to talk mm -hmm. about the issue or the, or the care or the concern that you have and, and not to talk about that it's coming from a place of faith. And I feel like maybe part of the integration for me has been in being able to say, no, no, this is coming from this deeply held conviction and that's why I'm doing this. Mm. So it's a grounding. I, I think I think that's, uh, when we have seen religion used in political spaces uh, for, for ways that are um, what, what can feel very extreme, um, I think it is, you know, I mean, when I think about like Christian nationalism being perpetuated as a way of uh, kind of endorsing white supremacy, endorsing patriarchy, endorsing militarism, that 
that is for me, that is not count. That is counter to the teachings of Jesus. That is counter to how I experience what George Fox said, you know, the Christ within. And so I think that, 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 um, that, that ability to, to not necessarily compare to, but, but state, as you just said, state, what is the positive aspect of uh, a connection to the divine of a sense of, of the spirit uh, living uh, within and motivating is, is really important for, for our work. I would say at FCNL for our work. And I, and I, and I think we're really uh, blessed to have colleagues who we share that, you know, on an interfaith basis, who, who share convictions uh, that lead them to work for a world that is um, seeking peace and justice and an earth restored. So I'm wondering, you know, along, along my experience of, I thought it would be one way and it actually was another, you know, what did you think it would be like to be a public friend when you came into this job and how has your view of, of that role changed uh, as you've lived into it? That's a great question. Um, I, I guess I, I guess I wasn't sure exactly what to expect. And I, I think, I think there's a, at once a, a notion that, you know, um, as a friend, we really um, rely on the community of, of other friends to both support, but also to elder. I mean, to kind of, you know, it's not, it's not that you become, you know, you, it's not that you, you go into a leadership role and you just have everything figured out. You know, you still have to come back and kind of understand and have people who are giving guidance and people who are like, um, uh, paying attention and, and helping you kind of shape where you need to go. And so I think, um, I think, you know, figuring out how to find that, you know, was, you know, sometimes a, a challenge of, of, because there's a, because there's kind of an assumption that if you're in this role, you know, you, you, um, you've got to figure it out. And I think one of the, one of the characteristics of friends sometimes is that we, um, assign, uh, particularly to people who may, who may be in certain kinds of positions. And I don't want to say just in, not just working for organizations, but sometimes we kind of look to people to have a, uh, with a sense of like, oh, you know, purity or perfectionism. And I'd say if there's anything we need to readjust ourselves to as friends is to let go of that, you know, let go of that notion that there are, you know, Quakers who have have it all figured out. You know, we're we're all uh, on a journey, and um, we learn from one another. So I think recognizing that even though stepping into this role of a great Quaker organization um, didn't mean that um, I wasn't going to still be learning uh, spiritually as well as intellectually or politically, and and so I think that was um, an important uh, an important opportunity personally for me to be able to do that. Um, but I would just say that one of the things that it was has been you know incredibly rich that I didn't expect coming into this role was, um, you know I've, I've really had the opportunity to travel I've, I've had some international travel but I've also had the opportunity to travel around the United States and um, meet donors meet activists uh, speak in various locations and and worship in, in with lots of people and I have found uh, extraordinary joy in that and extraordinary sense of connection um, with. With, with people um, just in, in Quaker meetings and worship groups and settings that's been really quite wonderful. Um, and uh, a practice that I would like to continue when I stop working at FCNL once um, travel is, is a little bit easier. Yeah, I think the word that came to mind when you were talking was this question of authority and like, mm. um, you know, I think as Quakers, as friends, we believe everyone has authority because of their their relation to God, but then also, you know, to be a, a the head of an organization, you're sort of given this authority, like I'm in mm. charge of this. And so it's like, how do you, how do you navigate that um, sort of relationship of, um, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And actually, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, some people on the call know that um, I actually was just um, in London, one of the travels I got to do, uh, I was in London, um, with Quaker heads of agencies. Uh, Bridget Moix, our incoming general secretary was there remotely. So we had some people there remotely and some people there in person. Um, and it's one of those 
uh, moments where there are the, the Quaker United Nation offices um, and Quaker Council on European Affairs and um, FCNL and FWCC, Friends World Community and Consultation, are all like in a period of six months having new heads of organizations come in. So it was, just seemed like a really good moment. And really the opening question was about authority and about our authority as heads or as leaders in an organization. And you know, for, for me, I've always thought about a lot of our authority for the work we do at FCNL coming from friends meetings because of the way we do priorities process and set our legislative priorities by going out to Quaker meetings and churches and asking them what we should be prioritizing. We go out and ask about our policy. And you know that policy document is something I have relied on consistently to, to guide us because it has really been shaped by friends and shaped by our own policy committee and our general committee. So to me, that's a kind of authority that comes but but there is you know what, but as friends we also we also listen inwardly for um, that call for that sense of um, uh, and some people call it intuition the kind of energy that comes from knowing something the kind of recognition um, and I think that you know there's um, as uh, we we test it I guess that's the other part is we test it. Well, I want to come to this question about ministry, because something I've heard you talk about a lot is this idea of um, sort of the work that FCNL is doing and, and um, in some sense, Quaker leadership as a form of ministry. And can you talk about how that connection has shown up for you in your work at FCNL? So it just, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get intrigued by the chat, and I know I'm not supposed to be looking at <laughs> That's okay. okay. We will get to the chat. Please okay. keep putting right. your questions in. I'll turn the chat up. Say your question again, Alicia. I apologize. I wanted I wanted to uh, ask you about the connection between Quaker leadership and ministry. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and how you've experienced it. Well, uh, so credit to uh, my friend Jay Marshall, the former dean of Earlham School of Religion, for really kind of provoking the question about Quaker leadership uh, before I even came to FCNL. He was he he was really thinking a lot about that, and and not he he's not the only one who's been thinking about it. But um, I so I, I I guess I would say I think there's I, I'm really interested in leadership, and I'm really interested in how people lead, and I think it I think it can change over time. I'm not sure I I'm not sure if there's only one way to be a Quaker leader. I've I've seen, you know, many people lead in as Quakers in Quaker spaces in ways that are really um, powerful. Some are people who are very quiet in their leadership and some are people who are much more outgoing. Um, I think uh, some are great clerks, some are great meeting participants. And so there are a lot of roles that people can play, a lot of gifts that people bring to that. Um, I, I think that I think that ministry really is trying to recognize that call that comes. And again, that call can be a call of ministry to lead. It can be a call of ministry to, um, to be pastoral, to provide support. It can be a call of ministry to witness, even in a singular way. And so that's where the community of support comes through, I think, to help people understand calling. And you know, the message I was just captivated by was from Gretchen and really thinking a lot about um, how do we, how do we, I would say, listen into and love into being the ministry of people who are younger um, or the ministry, and it isn't only people who are younger, but I do think it requires us to um, listen and encourage, affirm, name, um, and be present, you know, as a witness almost for other people who are testing their own sense of ministry and leading. And, you know, Alicia, I mean, you, you know, we've talked about the relationship you and I have had, but, you know, and for those who are on this call, you should know that Alicia is, has served at FCNL longer than anyone else in the whole organization and, um, has done many different jobs at FCNL. Um, and I've, been with her as she's kind of moved through probably three different positions. And I've, I've seen you grow. I mean, we've talked about this, about just, you know, your own kind of, um, not just as a Quaker leader, but also I think, you know, you just described a little bit about your own spiritual life and it's been powerful. And, you know, Bobby, who's doing our tech tonight is another person who's shared 
pretty openly about his own growth um, within FCNL, but it, it, can, it doesn't have to happen just within an organization. I happen to think, um, partly because I've been at FCNL for a long time, that our Quaker organizations, and I'm not, this is not just FCNL, I think Quaker Voluntary Service uh, does this, but I think, I think we are, I think we are um, kind of entryways for people to come in, for young people in particular to come in when we have these young adult programs, for young people to come in and, and, and test how they make meaning within the context of the work that we do. Well, that's probably a good transition into uh, some audience questions. I, I know people have been sending them in in the chat. Um, I want to start with a question from Barb Platt, which actually I, I wanted to ask you anyway. So thank you, Barb, for preempting uh, this question. But what are some of the spiritual practices that have kept you grounded in, in this demanding role? Uh, having a support committee, uh, some of whom may be on this call, and so gratitude to my support committee. Um, so that that uh, having that kind of grounding and knowing that I have, you know, I can share on a monthly basis with someone, uh, participating in worship, um, going to, to meeting for worship, and particularly going to worship when I don't have to speak or be on um, has been really powerful. Um, always reading, you know, there are, there are certain, I mean, uh, Parker Palmer has consistently been an inspiration for me as a, a living Quaker, but there are, you know, I find inspiration in reading Kendall Hill pamphlets or, you know, many things, but I think, I think also just the opportunity, as I mentioned before, traveling and meeting people and, you know, just listening to, you know, the, the everyday ways that people live their faith or the kinds of challenges that they have and what they're experiencing and, and what people, um, the kinds of, you know, pain or difficulties people have um, and seeing how they live through that. I guess that's, I don't know that that's a uniquely Quaker practice, but I think that is a way of, um, of, of listening, listening to the experiences of other people and, and understanding how they come through those experiences to live their faith. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the practices that's been important to me. Yeah, I think it's a whole separate conversation, but I think the question of, of like how to participate in a meeting or in a, in, a, in a Quaker space as a Quaker while also sort of having a hat that you're wearing that is <laughs> more professional, I remember, um, I think it was Dorsey Green who was telling me about someone who who told their meeting that they weren't allowed to talk to them about yearly meeting business during worship. <laughs> they just, you know, were very clear about that role definition. I think that's something, you know, people working in Quaker spaces are always always navigating. Um, I want to ask this question from Ian Harrington, who says, "What legislative accomplishment during your time at FCNL has meant the most to you personally?" Still to come, Ian, I'm waiting for the Build Back Better Act to get passed by the Senate, which we're all waiting for right now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm only being a little bit facetious. This act is huge. I mean, the, the resources in there to meaningfully address childhood poverty, to meaningfully support families in a way that we haven't done for decades in this country is so exciting. And as you all know, because the, Ian and many other people who were at our annual meeting lobbied on this, um, and the House passed the bill during our annual meeting in Quaker Public Policy Institute, which was very exciting, but we're still waiting for action in the Senate. Um, so that it, it is just a, it's a significant piece of legislation. And so that was important, that's important. Um, you know, the step forward with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, the nuclear agreement between Iran and the United States was clearly a huge accomplishment that um, the former president uh, withdrew from that was a deep disappointment. And, you know, we are, you know, U.S. is back in negotiations, but, you know, it's pretty difficult right now. Um, I think the work that we've done um, on, uh, you know, the, the legis some specific legislation that's passed and that actually was signed into law by Trump. It was the first step act on, on addressing criminal just sentencing reform and also the LAB Cell and Genocide Prevention Act. And I think that, I think that the challenge of, of legislation that moves so slowly um, can be really frustrating. You know, I, I, I know that last week when we knew that 
the AUMF repeal, the 2002 AUMF repeal wasn't going to be in the National Defense Authorization Act. It was, it was hard. I mean, people have worked so hard on that this year and over the years and to, to not have it be part of that bill was really a, a challenge. And so I think, I think, you know, knowing that what we're doing is always pushing, always pushing forward. And it is absolutely true that it's often, you know, one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. But I think that is the nature of uh, the work that we do and, and being able to, um, persistently witness is, is actually incredibly important. And so I, I guess I would say that uh, I think I've come to see that the work that we're doing as being a voice that, that is reliable and that's consistent and persistent can help change the narrative of what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and move us, you know, sometimes in steps smaller than we want to towards passage of legislation. But don't stop advocating for the Build Back Better Act. There's, a, there's an action alert on the website, I'm sure. I'm sure Bobby can dig it up and put the link in the chat if you haven't written recently. Um, I guess along the, the political uh, lines as well, there's a question from Brigitte Alexander, Pittsburgh meeting, who says, is FCNL able to bridge the political divide in this country right now, and particularly about um, are Republican legislatures receptive to the message that we're bringing? They are receptive to the message that we're bringing. You know, I, I think we're seeing, I mean, all of us, uh, so in 2011, when I arrived at FCNL, David Culp came, who was our nuclear disarmament lobbyist came up to me and he said, you know, there's a bigger divide than there ever has been. And, you know, David's gone, uh, sadly, but I think, you know, most of us would say there's a bigger divide now than there was even in 2011. And, and it feels, it feels like it's deepened, you know, it feels like it's like kind of a heart, harsher lines, particularly when we think about, you know, some of the extremist commentary that's coming from members of Congress to one another, you know, the, um, it's appalling, you know, the, the comments that are made about um, Muslims or the comments that are made about, you know, using guns and violence. And it's just, it's, it's just sad that we haven't gone, you know, directly to that. What we do do is to continue to reach out and encourage people to reach out to their own members. And there are plenty of Republicans who welcome meetings with FCNL constituents and with FCNL advocates. Um, at our annual meeting this year, we gave uh, our Peace and Disarmament Award to a Republican Senator from Indiana to um, Representative, or excuse me, Senator Todd Young. And so, we, you know, we don't like everything Senator Young does, but there, you know, we didn't like everything President Obama did either. You know, I mean, there's just, that that's the nature of politics to some extent. And we, we know that it's very, very important to continue the dialogue with both Republicans and Democrats. I believe that Quakers overall have an incredibly important voice uh, to um, think about how we are engaging in our own local communities and how we are using the skills that we have uh, in terms of whether it's um, listening skills, uh, uh, speaking truth skills, um, that we think about how we use those uh, to, 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 to uh, whether it's really bridge a divide, but at least to have a presence, I think is really important. Yeah, I just, I wanna ask a follow-up that uh, was inspired by that question just about, um, Like, I, I know that it can be, um, well, I think, you know, a, a lot of the work that FCNL does is about like, what is the step that we can take now? Um, and sometimes that step is not everywhere we would like it to be, um, either organizationally or personally. And sort of how have you thought about, um, you know, motivating and, and getting people to, to act for something that, that maybe doesn't feel very, um, like it doesn't feel like that big a step forward. Like sort of how, how do you navigate like being personally maybe disappointed or, or not uh, entirely clear that this is where we wanna be, but like still wanting to get people to, to take action. And, and that comes up 
not infrequently, Alicia, we, we see it, you know, where there, where there are, sometimes there are bills that are, what I would say is probably more prophetic or go farther and probably are more consistent with where we are. But because those are bills that are really not going to go anywhere, we may not choose to advocate on them. We don't use the power that we have to, to push that. And, you know, that's going to be constantly, you know, even when you think about our practices as Quakers is to, to try to understand, um, uh, divine revelation. I mean, as a quick organization, we have to co constantly keep thinking about, and there's, there's not a, you know, we can't be stuck in one place. We have to continue to evolve. And I think we'll continue to do that and think about how we take a position. But I, I believe that, you know, sometimes taking a position that may not be as far as we believe we need to go, we know that this is where we are today and this is what we can get done. And so I think that's been an, an important part of what we do. It can be uh, personally challenging, as you noted, because we may want to be able to do more, but as an organization, we've chosen to take this particular position. And so I guess what I would say to our constituents is that there are gonna be times when FCNL may choose a particular piece of legislation that you don't 100% agree with, and we hope you'll navigate with this, but you may decide to, to step out of it. And that, you know, there. The, the great news is that FCNL works on a number of issues. And so there's going to be one or two or three or four that people are going to want to engage in. And uh, we hope you will always engage with us. Yeah. I know when Bobby and I talk with meetings, we sometimes talk about the sort of uh, ecosystem of social change and how um, I know a number of people look to the Bill Moyers model of sort of the role of advocacy and the role of other kinds of um, mm -hmm other kinds of, of social change and, and you know, FCNL is not saying everybody should do this only, but we're saying this is a part of how change happens, so. For sure, and yesterday, yesterday I was at the office and I was walking, I just went out for a walk around lunch and there was uh, Reverend Barber holding a press conference right in front of the Senate. You know, there's a whole group of people walking by, you know, the, last week there was a group of, uh, Im you know, immigration activists, mostly young people, I think from La Casa in Maryland who came in. I mean, those, those public forms of witness, those public forms of protest, in some cases, people getting arrested, those are powerful and they, they help move a conversation along, you know, just as letters to the editor can help move a conversation along. So there's not one thing, there are many things that are needed. And, um, you know, we're on, the, we're on the sort of policy political end of things, but I'm really grateful the kinds of witness that many of our Quaker colleagues do and many, many people who aren't part of an organization are doing. I think those are all really important. And I, I guess I just want to say one thing specifically about climate change. And when I think about the, the kind of massive movements that young adults are leading uh, around climate change, it is, it is a source of inspiration. And honestly, it's a source of um, power that that we all should regard with a great deal of great gratitude, but also understanding of how we can support because this is a powerful voice and the same on gun violence prevention. I mean, just thinking about like young people who are who are asking hard questions and demanding change is um, that I firmly believe that's gonna be one of the ways that we see change. Then I wanna come back, uh, there are a couple questions um, you know, that you mentioned the question, the question from Gretchen Baker Smith. Um, there's another question as well about, about this idea of sort of learning from young adults and nurturing their activism um, and, and the next generation of Quaker leaders. And also, you know, the, the tensions, uh, Dan and Martha mentioned the tensions that can come, you know, from, you know, perhaps people who are older or who have more, um, are more connected to the way things are happening now, <laughs> um, you know, who, who might feel like they're being supplanted by, by a new leadership, you know, or a new way of doing something coming in. So, um, you know, I know we had a whole conversation, you had a whole conversation with Mills Klinkenberg at uh, Beacon Hill Friends House a couple months ago about this question of leadership and, and young adults, but um, sort of, I'm wondering if there are some thoughts on, on those. I, I just sort of threw a bunch of ideas out there, but um, yeah, you know, this this well, question. I think, like, yeah, I, I guess ahead. let me just jump into it right away because I think one of the things that we often see in in monthly meetings is 
particularly in monthly meetings where the preponderance of people are older, you know, look more like me even than they look like you, that I think it's really important, and we use the term to say, you know, to not think of young adults in a token way, you know, to think like, oh, we have three young adults here, or we have one young adult, let's find out what they think, you know. I mean, I think we have to regard, you know, participation in a really equitable way. Um, and I think we need to be open, but I think we not need to be overly expectant, I guess. And so there's a balance there, of sort of how young adults engage. You know, one of the things that I think is incredibly important is the, the idea of being welcoming, but the idea of holding space for, you know, young adults who are coming into a worship setting to, to be themselves as well and not to expect them to become little, you know, um, mini me's for older Quakers. And so I guess the, the part that I recognize is that, you know, the way people 20 years younger, 30 years younger, 40 years younger engage with um, the life of the spirit may be very different than the way I do. And uh, so I think institutionally, we have to think about how we allow for that space and that sense of belonging and how we create community in a way that um, has, a, has equity and that, that it isn't, that you're not a weighty Quaker, weighty Quaker, you know, just because you are in your 60s or 70s or 80s, you know, you may be, but, you know, there's wisdom that comes from people in their teens and, you know, even from children, but certainly from people who are, you know, exploring the world. And so I think, I think that's important. And I do think that kind of like mentoring and, you know, recognition of um, sometimes older friends who are really willing to just be, to have a presence is, is really important. And to be able to engage with people as they are exploring is, is really, really important. It, organizationally, I think, you know, we obviously have set up a lot of young adult programs and try to create uh, a space for the young adult programs that isn't um, driven by, that's driven by young adults, I guess what I would say is that, that it's, there's more an experience there where um, there's guidance, there's kind of like training, but it's not, um, it's a recognition that, you know, the voices of people telling their own stories is what's going to be most powerful um, and often more powerful than the voice I may bring, you know, my story. And so that, that I think has been a pretty fundamental aspect of how we've done our work at FCNL. And I, um, you know, I just, I really think there has to be a respect for it. I, and, and I think there's a, you know, I think there's been a pretty live conversation in the Religious Society of Friends about being willing, willing to change the kind of forms and structures that um, allow people to engage in ways that they can in their lives. I mean, you know, I'll just say that even 20, you know, 20 years ago, there was a conversation about the fact that, oh, you know, women aren't going to do all the volunteer work in the meeting because they're working, they're working, you know, not, they're not, they're, they're, they can't do volunteer work if they have full-time jobs. And so I think in the same way, we're in another generation where you have to think about like, well, how do young people engage with our meetings and engage with Quakerism? fascinating conversation. There's going to be a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue going on about that. And I'm, I'm excited that um, a lot of it's being led by uh, young adults. Yeah. And even by the very generous standards of Quakers, I, I have aged out of being a young adult. So <laughs> I, I am, I'm very excited by seeing, you know, where, where, uh, where people are leading now um, and being able to listen to them. Um, I, just wanted, I want to say, I, 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 know, I know this is really more about sort of my, but I, I am, um, many of you know Bridget Moix, who's coming in as the incoming general secretary. And one of the best stories that Bridget told about five years ago, we were having a conversation and she said, she was on our executive committee at the time. She said, I just want to say, I'm not a young adult anymore. So stop calling me a young adult. <laughs> Bridget is, has a great deal of energy and she's going to bring that to FCNL. As I'm really excited about her coming. Um, and she is someone who has also grown up in a way through FCNL and been deeply influenced um, and brings a really profound spiritual connection and will be a, will be a public friend. Yes, I'm sure we'll have new conversations about all of these questions uh, in the year ahead. Um, I wanna ask one final question and then um, I think we'll need to, unfortunately, I mean, clearly we could just keep going, but uh, we do need to, wrap up at, at one point. Um, you know, I know that that two words that you have really um, 
brought in, not brought into our work, but have really emphasized in the work that we've done in the last year, our hope and gratitude. And um, I know we've had some conversations, you know, I, I think sometimes they can seem, you know, it's, it's a slogan or something, but I, I know that for you, those have really, you have thought deeply about, about how that, those two words uh, relate to the advocacy that we've done this year and that we're doing and, and your time with the organization. So I wanted to end by asking you um, to, to talk a little bit about those two words and, and how they relate to this work of Quaker advocacy. Thanks, Alicia. I, I, they are words that are really important to me. And I, so I'll, let me start by using the word hope because that's a word that I think people long before I got to FCNL, you know, used with FCNL is that FCNL advocates with a, with a kind of hope. And um, I wanna distinguish hope from optimism. Optimism is also important, but hope I, for me is a much more deeply connected um, sense that uh, that is connected to faith, that's distinct from faith, but is connected to it in the, in the idea that there is a, as, as we've talked about before, even earlier in worship or in the silent reflection tonight, that it is an expect expectation perhaps of something we can't see or something we don't know, but it is fundamentally something that we long for and are willing to work for and willing to be part of, even if we don't know when or what will come. And so by nature of um, the thinking about hope, it has to be deeper than something that's superficial. It has to be something that's part of our heart and souls. Um, and with gratitude, I think of gratitude as a spiritual practice. And um, Diana Butler Bass and others have written about gratitude as a spiritual practice. But for me, it, it, is, it is the notion that there is, um, while there can be, uh, I mean, you know, today's the day that we're marking 800,000 people having died from COVID. I mean, what a sense of despair that we're experiencing there. You know, the news about climate change is, is daily uh, despairing, I mean, almost. And it's just, it's hard sometimes to even know where to go when we have these global problems that feel really difficult. And yet we know that there is, that, that love exists. <laughs> We have experienced that. We know that there is an abundance. And so the question of how do we understand that abundance in our life, even in the face of racism, even in the face of sexism, even in the face of, and, and not just like incidents, I mean, systemic problems, um, is, to, is to channel that love, I think is really what we are called to do. And so, knowing that it's there, even if we're not feeling it and practicing a sense of, of gratitude, um, gratitude to God, but also gratitude to one another for, for what we bring to each other and what we can share with each other um, does seem to me to be a pretty important practice to, to uh, carry us forward. Um, and that kind of discipline, I mean, one of the other, you know, uh, the yearly meeting faith and practice books are important to me. We don't have a book that we all believe in as Quakers, but the, the faith and practice books that are created give us guidance. But those books are also called books of discipline. And so I think of the practice of gratitude and the practice of hope as forms of discipline. And so it's something we do even when we, it doesn't always feel like it's easy to do. And I am particularly uh, grateful to the people who are on this call and the folks who are so much part of the FCNL community. It's, uh, it's been a real blessing to participate um, tonight, but also over the past decade with so many people. Thank you. It's been really fun uh, to get to have this conversation and, and you know, think about some of these big questions and get, get the wisdom of your experience. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you're not going away. You're still, you're still around. You're still part of the FCNL community, uh, even when you don't have the title after your name. So thank you so much for, for the work you've done and, and for uh, our relationship and for being here tonight and sharing this conversation with, with me and with our audience. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Bobby then to close us out. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Diane. Really quickly, I want to hop in and say, as a young adult Quaker, I have been so grateful 
for the spaces that both of you have created for me to learn, to feel included, and, and the openings that you've allowed or not allowed, but you know, helped cultivate for me to also change the structures uh, within FCNL, within Quakerism. I'm just so grateful to you both for providing a roadmap for what Quaker leadership can look like. So thank you. And um, thank you friends for being such a lovely engaged audience this evening. I want to encourage you all to come back during our website over the break as we will be rolling out a lot of content throughout over the, the holidays that will be uh, really, really uh, fascinating. Um, we will have action alerts up. So please keep taking action throughout the, throughout the holidays. And I also wanna ask you to save the date for Wednesday, January 26th at 6.30 Eastern for our first uh, Quaker Changemaker event in um, 2022. This event will focus on FCNL's legislative priority setting process and how your Quaker community can participate in setting our agenda for the next two years. So I hope you'll save that date and look out for an email invitation in early January. And if you haven't yet, please set a date to hold that discernment to help us determine our agenda with your own community. And with that, I will say thank you, friends. Good night. Happy holidays. Go forth. Be well. Know you are beloved. And we'll see you next time. Ever faithfully onward we go.